tonight um, we're zooming zooming with us from British Columbia, which might be a record distance for a light cook virtual program. Our speaker is bird and nature photographer Liron Gertzman. Liron got his hands on a borrowed camera and a pair of binoculars at the age of five, and he hasn't stopped since. Six years ago, at the age of seventeen, he swept the youth category of the 2018 Audubon Photography Awards. This year, at the ripe old age of 23, Liron won the grand prize of the 2023 Audubon Photography Awards, that's Audubon Magazine, for improbably a photograph of two rock pigeons. He also won an honorable mention in the professional category for a haunting photo of a northern hawk owl. If any of you have been up to uh, Saxon Bog and seen northern hawk owls, they are amazing. Um, and that photograph required that he snowshoe for days in freezing weather, looking for the bird and the perfect shot. He also uh, won a special designation in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition this year. Liran uses his photography as a soapbox to encourage people to appreciate the natural world and the challenges it faces. So his is both an eye and a voice that we urgently need today. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Liran. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm going to go ahead here and share my screen. We're good. All right. Well, again, hello, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate you having me here to present. Um, it's, exciting, it's exciting for me to hear that perhaps I'm breaking a record as the longest distance uh, Zoom connection. Uh, so that's really exciting for me. Um, and I'm going to be sharing you a story with you today, a story from my corner of the world, which is British Columbia, Canada, the West Coast. Um, I titled it The Great Gathering, but we're going to be taking a look at the coastal ecosystem here and the amazing gatherings of both birds and a lot of other wildlife species that takes place every year, especially around the annual salmon runs, uh, which is going on right now as we speak. So yeah, just to tell you a little bit more about myself, I uh, I love the outdoors um, and I feel really, really fortunate to be based in the part of the world where I live. Um, British Columbia has both spectacular coastal ecosystems, but also amazing mountains. Um, this is me hiking up in, this is actually just north of British Columbia in the Yukon Territory in Kluwani National Park, picture taken by a friend of mine, Ian. But I, I love to get outdoors, go explore new places, and actually often spend a lot of time, in many cases, getting to know specific areas and, and really getting a feel for the birds and the wildlife um, that inhabit these amazing environments. Um, so my photography pursuits have taken me in many, to many places around the world, but I, I love the coast of British Columbia. I wouldn't live anywhere else. There are so many incredible things to see. And this is another photo of me uh, kind of behind the camera photographing salmon underwater on Vancouver Island. Um, and as you can see, we have amazing gatherings of salmon, but this part of the world where I live um, is also on a bird migration superhighway, the Pacific Flyway. So every year, millions and millions of birds migrate north up the Pacific Flyway, heading up to their Arctic breeding grounds in the spring. And then come fall, they head south back down the Pacific Flyway, uh, many of them heading all the way down to South America. Incredible migrations that these birds undertake. And for a lot of these birds, the Fraser River Delta, which is kind of the region near where I live, is a really critical migratory stopover site. Um, so you get huge flocks of shorebirds, and we also have a lot of wintering birds here. These This flock is our dunlin, um, and yeah, we have maybe 100,000 dunlin that winter within an hour of where I live. So very cool to see those flocks, and big flocks are a big theme here. Pretty much any, almost any time of year, there are big flocks around. Right now, there's also tons of snow geese migrating through the region. Um, we have hundreds of thousands that pass through um, on their migration from Russia down to places like Oregon and California, and tens of thousands that spend the whole winter in the area. Um, but we also don't just have these more water birds. We also have songbirds come springtime. We see the arrival of the rufous hummingbirds and the warblers and all those other uh, species. So I really attribute this amazing access to nature and the location where I've been fortunate to grow up and live to how I fell in love with birds and, and wildlife, because it's a place where you don't have to go far to see amazing bird spectacles. Um, even urban parks, walking through the city, you see lots of birds. And speaking of walking through the city and seeing lots of birds, 
Um, I, I'll share a little bit more about the photo that won the Audubon Photography Awards of these two rock pigeons. Um, I was actually quite excited when I found out that this particular image that, uh, that I submitted was selected because to me, this represents something special in that anyone could have taken this picture really because it's not, it didn't require traveling to some exotic, you know, location, some far off country. Um, it didn't even require snowshoeing. It didn't require hiking, nothing. There's pigeons in cities all around the world. Um, and I was just fortunate enough to come across this opportunity and photograph it. But but um, I think that I, I've really, especially in recent years, learned to appreciate the wildlife that is found in the urban environments. And although a pigeon might not be as exciting, um, they are absolutely beautiful. And this pair, they were allopreening. So when they're preening each other on a, on a little kind of on the side of a pier. And it was kind of a bright overcast day. So they were in the light. And I purposely kind of positioned myself so that the backdrop behind the pigeons would be the dark shadowy underside of the pier. Um, and by doing that, I was able to get like a natural black background effect in camera. So it kind of made it look like a studio portrait of these pigeons, even though it was a completely natural lighting effect out in the wild. Um, so this is the picture that won the Audubon Photography Awards this year. Um, this picture does convey beautiful beauty of birds, but something it doesn't convey is the environment, the coast of British Columbia. So I want to share some more with you about this coastal environment, um, which is going to be the theme of today's presentation. So this is, as you can see, a beautiful place. And it's fun to jump in right away to the, you know, the big charismatic megafauna, the eagles, the whales, the bears. But I like to look at things from the perspective of the whole ecosystem. I have a biology background from the University of British Columbia. Um, so I like to, yeah, look at things from an ecosystem wide perspective. So we are going to start small with plankton and we're going to build our way up. So this here is a picture I took with my cell phone through a microscope at a marine science station um, during a university course um, here on, on the coast of British Columbia. And this is plankton. Just what when you scoop the water here, this is what lives in the water. Um, our waters in this part of the world are very murky throughout much of the year. And the reason they're so murky, uh, especially in the summertime, is because there is so much plankton and so much life in the water. And this plankton, both phytoplankton, which are basically tiny plants floating at the will of the current, and zooplankton, which are tiny animals floating at the will of the current, they, they are the bottom of a massive interconnected food chain. And we're going to be exploring all the different animals today that, that are a part of this connected food chain and ecosystem. So the plankton float at the will of the current. They feed amazing animals and they make for a very, very rich intertidal zone in this part of the world. So we have big tides here, maybe up to in certain parts of the coast, up to like 25 foot tides um, that get you know uncovered and covered up every single day. And there is so much amazing life just looking at the intertidal zone. So whenever I'm out looking for birds, photographing birds, guiding clients on tours or photography workshops, and if we get the odd day where there isn't much wildlife activity, I always know that I can just look down at the ground on the beach and there will be a treasure trove of life. Um, in this picture here, you can see a bunch of goose barnacles and uh, northern bay mussels. And when you really look amongst the crevices in the rocks, there are some spectacular intertidal creatures that are found on the coast here. Here's just a few of them. In the top left, a chitin. In the top right, an abalone. On the bottom right, an aggregating anemone. And on the bottom left, a nudibranch, which is a, a sea slug. So we have this amazing intertidal life. And this intertidal life, they're feeding on oftentimes plankton, if they're a filter feeder, like these mussels and barnacles. Um, the chitons and nudibranchs might be feasting on like algae and stuff on the rocks. Um, but there are, of course, birds that are a part of this intertidal ecosystem as well. Um, one that is gathering in big numbers around Vancouver right now are surf scoters. We get big flocks that winter in this region um, and they dive underwater and they are mostly feeding on mussels here. So they, they dive down for mussels and mussels tend to grow in kind of the mid intertidal zone. Um, so you can see them up close when the tide's a little bit higher coming to feed on the mussels. Um, and they also dig for, uh, for clams in the more muddy sediments in other areas that don't have as much rock substrate because the mussels grow in the rocks and the clams grow in the mud. So we get big flocks of surf scoters um, at this time of year uh, feeding in this, in this very food abundant area. Um, so with my photography, I'm always looking for 
um, new ways to capture ecosystems and tell stories with pictures. And, and if we go back here, one of the things about the intertidal zone to me is that so many of the creatures, they're, it's hard to believe they're even real. They're almost alien-esque. So I was like, how do I capture the intertidal zone that kind of feels alien-esque, combines, you know, brings this mystical feel. And what I came up with was this picture here. Um, these are aggregating sea anemones um, underwater. And this is a half underwater, half above water photo um, where you can see the Milky Way and the moon setting on the horizon and the sea anemones below. And the way I got this shot was by using an underwater um, housing here and uh, having the underwater housing half below water, half above water, um, and just very precisely get managing to get this shot. So I call this photo a meeting of alien worlds. <laughs> to go back to uh, some, some of the birds, um, like I said, we have the surf scoters feeding in the intertidal zone, especially in rocky areas where you have a lot of mussels. Um, but the intertidal zone also um, is really the important habitat for all of those hundreds of thousands, millions of migratory shorebirds that's, that migrate up and down the Pacific Flyway. Um, here, this is a flock of red knots roosting on some mudflats. And for these shorebirds, the mudflats are both a feeding site and a rest site. They're on long migrations. They need a place to re relax and rest. Um, red knots are among the more uncommon of the shorebird species here, but they are absolutely beautiful when they do show up and lots of fun to watch. Um, I photographed this flock feeding on the west coast of Vancouver Island, and as the waves crashed, they would run up the beach, and as the waves receded, they would run down the beach. So by just kind of positioning myself up above them on the beach, I managed to get them running towards me every time the waves crashed on the beach, and that's how I got this shot here. But we have an amazing diversity of shorebirds. I'll just briefly introduce you to another few species that we see in the intertidal zone. This is a young red-necked phalarope, another uncommon one that we get in the mostly in the fall migration. And this I kind of purposely photographed with a wider angle lens, again, to showcase the environment. I love to do that when I can, showcase the environment in my photographs. But I also like to reveal the close-up details. Here is a short-billed dowager preening its feathers. Um, and here is another species. This is another pretty rare one here, but one I've seen a few times. This is a Hudsonian godwit. So we get a real diversity of shorebird species migrating through here. This is a, a golden plover, um, an American golden plover. And one more, this is perhaps the most common uh, shorebird species we have here is the Dunlin. And I say that because we have them all, not just in the migration season, but also in the winter time in huge flocks. Um, but in the springtime is when they get these beautiful colors, um, the black belly and the orange feathering on the back. And this one here pulled some kind of worm out of the mud. Uh, so amazing shorebird migration. Um, and they are just one part of this hugely interconnected ecosystem. But building up back, if we think back to the plankton, the plankton feed a lot of animals in the ocean in the intertidal zone. They also feed a lot of small fish. And those small fish go on to feed other fish, such as the salmon. And I want to introduce to you our main character for today, which is going to be the salmon. So salmon are beautiful, as you can see. These are Chinook salmon. Um, Every year, Chinook salmon and all the other Pacific salmon species come spawn in our rivers and streams on the coast of British Columbia. Um, they head upstream against the current. This is the tail of a pink salmon fighting its way through some shallow water. Um, it's a difficult journey. It takes a lot of energy. It's, uh, it's, it's like witnessing a miracle in action. Um, they, they make their way up river and where they're heading to is the very place that, were, that they were born. Um, estimates vary, but something like 80, 90 percent of all salmon on the on the coast here return to the exact river system, the exact spot where they were born to reproduce and give life to the next generation. So what these salmon do in the rivers is the females lay their eggs, the males spray their sperm, external fertilization occurs, uh, the eggs get buried in the river sediment, and then later those eggs will hatch. The young salmon head out the river into the ocean. Salmon live their lives out in the ocean. They spend a few years out there growing, getting larger. And then at the end of their life, most salmon head back upstream into the very rivers that they were born to start the cycle all over. So for most Pacific salmon, this spawning journey that they make heading upstream is a one-way trip. They use all of their energy. It's very difficult. They give their lives in order to reproduce and give life to the next generation. Um, Already, just once you learn that, I think it's an incredible thing. Um, it's a very 
perilous and challenging journey that they make. You know, each salmon lays, like, you know, two, three thousand eggs and only a few of those will survive to adult to be adults and to come back and spawn. Um, but something that made me develop even more respect for salmon was spending time photographing them underwater, because in this environment, you really see um, how well suited they are for it compared to us humans. Sometimes when I'm photographing these rivers, there's strong currents in the shallows. Sometimes I'm holding onto a rock with all my strength, keep myself in position to get these shots and the salmon are just casually swimming up against this strong currents like it's absolutely nothing. Um, so I've definitely um, found a, a newfound respect for these salmon after spending time photographing them underwater in the rivers. And this past summer, I actually wanted to try to do something a little different with, with photographing salmon. We, I always like to think about, you know, how do we see an animal or a bird or a fish most of the time? How do I photograph it from a perspective that's completely different? So with salmon, we're normally looking down at salmon when I see them in the rivers. Or if you're underwater, you're looking at eye level with the salmon. But it's very hard to get a perspective of salmon in a stream from underneath because you would have to spend a lot of time underwater. And the salmon also are pretty skittish around people in the water. It's just a difficult perspective to get below a school of salmon. But this this um, this summer, I gave it a go. I managed to get this shot here of a salmon swimming through a river canyon. And my friend there, Quinn, um, is at the surface there, um, which you can see as well. And I was quite happy with this shot, but I wanted to get a photo that had a lot of salmon because often you get big groups. And the reality was I was just free diving. I couldn't hold my breath long enough to stay down there and just be completely still until a big group of salmon came by. Um, so what I ended up doing was I, I set up my camera at the bottom of the river. And once I had it in place down there, just doing free dives down to the bottom, I, I anchored it in with some weights and I set it to just take a picture every second. And I left it in the river for like half an hour. And I managed to get this shot here of a whole group of salmon swimming over top of the camera. Is it a little bit scary to leave your camera at the bottom of a river? Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a little bit uh, sketchy, even though, you know, the gear is built to do this. There's nothing, there's nothing, you know, wrong with doing this in terms of, in terms of the gear, but you know, it, it's, it always feels a little awkward leaving expensive equipment at the bottom of a river in the current and, and hoping it's going to be there when you come back. But uh, obviously I, I did my research and was very careful with how I set everything up, but yeah, these salmon are amazing. So let's go back to some of the other animal species that rely on the salmon. So while the salmon do spend their reproductive time in the rivers, they spend a lot of their life out in the oceans. And when they're in the oceans, they feed a multitude of wildlife. Amongst the species that they feed are pinnipeds, so seals and sea lions. These are stellar sea lions here, one male with a bunch of females. Um, salmon are one of many things that stellar sea lions eat in the ocean on the coast of British Columbia. Um, harbor seals, same thing. They eat many things, including salmon. And the harbor seals actually sometimes venture into the estuaries and up the rivers a little bit where the salmon are spawning. But of course, one of the highlights of being out photographing, you know, these animals that eat the salmon out in the ocean is that there's a lot of birds in our coastal waters as well. This is an interconnected ecosystem, you know, starting with the plankton all the way up to the salmon. There are so many, there's a real abundance of nutrients. So we have amazing bird life on the ocean as well. And I wanted to share a few of those open ocean species I see when I'm out on the water here. Um, this here is a sooty shearwater. This is probably our most common shearwater on the Pacific coast here. Um, these birds amaze me because they nest in New Zealand, and yet they're our most common shearwater off the west coast of Canada. Um, so that is obviously very far away from their breeding grounds in New Zealand. And when you get far enough offshore, um, out towards the continental shelf, we get to the territory of another amazing bird, the black-footed albatross. And here you can see one, a size comparison there with a pink-footed shearwater. Beautiful, huge birds. And they're nesting in Hawaii and traveling all the way to the coast of British Columbia to gather food and then flying all the way back to Hawaii to feed their young the food that they gathered on the coast of British Columbia. Um, so <laughs> albatross are just mind blowing, amazing, amazing birds. We have so many beautiful seabirds that I see out there. Um, tufted puffin nest on the coast of British Columbia. Also a very small number of horn puffin, which I got to see a few of out on the coast this summer while I was guiding some trips up in Haida Gwaii. Um, but tufted puffins are the more common puffin species and lots of like, uh, you know, cliff nesting birds as well, like um, pigeon guillemots. And while these species aren't eating salmon um, 
or at least not probably not many salmon, they are still a part of this ecosystem um, that the salmon are an integral part of. But to go back to animals that are directly eating the salmon, we have amazing, huge marine mammals on the coast here. And perhaps one of my favorites, it's always tough to decide, but one of my favorites has to be the orca. So we have two populations of orcas that we see most often. Um, there are some others that sometimes possess, but the two populations of orcas we see most often on the coast of British Columbia are what we call transient or bigs orca, which are marine mammal eating orca. So they are eating the seals and the sea lions that eat the salmon. And we also have resident orca, which eat salmon almost exclusively. So whether you're a transient or a resident orca, you are still dependent on salmon in some way, whether it's direct or indirect. But one of the amazing things about the orca is the size of their dorsal fin. The male's fully grown dorsal fin is about six feet tall. Um, and wanting to capture the size of the dorsal fin of the orca, I knew I needed to photograph from a really, really low perspective on the water. So here I was hanging off the side of the boat, holding my camera just like a couple inches over the edge of the water as this uh, kind of youngish, not quite fully grown, but, all, but almost fully grown. We call this like a sprouting male transient orca came by. So in orcas, the males are much bigger than the females. That's a, a son and mother in this picture here. Son on the left, mother on the right. But despite the males being much bigger, they are not in charge. Um, orcas live in matriarchal society. So it is the eldest female who leads the pod. Um, that is usually the mo it's usually a mother and her kids, or in, ma in many cases, a grandmother and her kids and their kids. Um, so, and they stay in these family groups groups for their entire lives. Salmon, um, you know, so a lot of people travel to British Columbia to see orca. I find of, of the general, maybe non-bird specific ecotourist, orcas are kind of often the thing people want to see the most, but their existence here is largely because of the salmon, especially those resident orcas, which almost exclusively eat salmon. And there's quite something and nothing like seeing an orca breach out of the water. Um, and, and again, as I mentioned earlier, I love to incorporate the environment into my photos and we have beautiful mountains on the coast here. So it, it was nice to get this orca lined up with uh, these mountains on Vancouver Island. And uh, one more shot of an orca here, uh, breathing as the sun was setting. You can see the sunset reflected in that six foot dorsal fin of this fully grown male Northern resident orca here. Um, so orcas, one of the one of the marine mammals that directly eat salmon. Some other marine mammals I see out there include dolphins. We have uh, we have often large groups of Pacific white sided dolphins come through. And one of the things that that drives me to be a photographer is just this the the way we can reveal details in nature that the eye just can't see, like the intricacies of the splash, the way the dorsal fin carves through the water and creates a loop is spectacular. And you just miss these sorts of moments when uh, just looking with our eyes. Not that it's not spectacular to just watch things with their eyes as well, but I love that cameras can reveal these hidden details in nature. I'm just gonna stop sharing for one moment and then reshare because I need to enable sound for this next one. All right. There we go. I'm gonna introduce uh, one more cetacean here, which is the whale dolphin family. And I'm gonna introduce it with some sound. So this animal here sounds like this. Often we're very focused on bird sounds and I absolutely love bird sounds and learning all my bird sounds, but there are amazing sounds in the ocean as well. So this sound that I'm about to play for you is a recording from a couple summers ago, an underwater recording I took um, just with a microphone, holding a microphone into the water um, while guiding in the North Central Coast of British Columbia. And this is what we heard. This is the call of the humpback whale. And specifically, it is a feeding call that they make when they are participating in a group cooperative feeding behavior known as bubble netting. So when humpback whales are bubble netting, 
they basically find a school of herring underwater. How they do any of this, we actually don't really know. But somehow they find a school of herring in the water. A whale will blow a ring of bubbles around the herring and kind of virtually trap them inside this bubble net. I don't think the fish are actually trapped, but they're they're kind of, you know, they, they feel like they're trapped inside this net of bubbles. And then a bunch of whales will all lunge to the surface at the same time. And this is a behavior that is almost exclusively occurring in the Great Bear Rainforest on the central and north coast of British Columbia and in southeast Alaska. It has occasionally been recorded in other parts of the world as well, but it almost exclusively, the only place you can reliably see this behavior is in southeast Alaska and the north central coast of British Columbia. It's an amazing thing to witness. Um, I've seen up to uh, 17 or 18 whales cooperatively feeding together like this, blowing bubbles and all lunging to the surface to capture herring. Herring, by the way, are one of the main foods that salmon eat in the ocean. Um, so much about whales are mysteries. They live in very murky waters. Um, and for being one of the most studied animals in the world, we know very little, relatively speaking, about them. For example, we don't really know why whales breach. Um, there's lots of theories that exist. Um, but no one knows the exact reason. We do know that it would take an immense amount of energy for a whale to do this. So there's almost certainly a reason. I wouldn't put sometimes just play and fun out of the question, um, but there's a lot of theories, communication, removing parasites, all sorts of stuff. A lot of theories exist. This was one of the most beautiful breaches I've seen. Um, this was last July. I was guiding my annual bald eagle and coastal wildlife photography workshop and we had a bunch of whales breaching. And what happened here was a humpback whale breached at sunset. The splash lit up like a fire with this light from the setting sun. And then as that splash was in the air, a second whale breached in front of that splash that was being lit up by the sun. Um, and this is the shot. Um, I, with any type of photography in nature, wildlife, birds, whales, anything, having an idea of predicting and understanding behavior is super, super critical for getting sh interesting shots because these sorts of behaviors make for the most interesting shots. And I always say when something interesting or exciting or unusual happens and you miss it, which happens all the time, of course, and you really want a shot of it, never put your camera down <laughs> because things tend to repeat themselves. And especially things like humpback whales breaching, I would say at least half of the time when I see one humpback whale breach, either another humpback whale will breach and right after it, or that same whale will end up breaching more than once. Um, so I didn't catch that first whale breach. I had my camera up as the splash was in the air, but because I had my camera up when that second whale breached in front of the splash, I was able to get this shot. And that was an amazing day. We had seen hundreds of eagles fishing and we'd seen these humpback whales breaching. And, and as we were having dinner and, and my clients were joking with me, like, oh, I don't know how you, we were going to be able to top that tomorrow. Um, and the next day was a good reminder that you don't necessarily need spectacular behavior to top an experience. The next day, we just found ourselves in a really quiet cove, no wind, and there were a few humpback whales surfacing in this cove, and there was flat calm, and the sun was coming down over the, the, the island, and the water was reflecting the dark, shadowy forest like you see it in this picture here, but the breath of the humpback whale was just being hit by the sun. And this was what the scene looked like. Um, and somehow this, everyone agreed, just being immersed in this and hearing them breathe and this calm peacefulness of the setting was even more special and spectacular than that watching the whales breach the day before. Um, so I, again, we have such incredible coastal marine life here um, in this wide interconnected ecosystem. And one of the, um, animals that I think is best to talk about when demonstrating just how interconnected the coastal ecosystem of British Columbia is, is this one here. Well, there's two animals in this picture. There's a sea otter eating sea urchins, which are, they look like spiky rocks, but they are living, breathing animals, just like us, sea urchins. Um, and sea otters are one of the only predators that the sea urchins have. Another one of their main predators are sunflower sea stars, but sea otters are really one of their main predators. There's very few animals that can eat sea urchins, and sea urchins make up a large part of the diet of sea otters. Because, and you know, they're very spiky, tough, hard-shelled um, creatures, so it's hard for most animals to eat them. Sea otters will often actually use like a rock to break them open. And what happened is sea otters 
happened to have the densest fur of any animal in the world. <laughs> so they were very heavily hunted for their fur and completely wiped out from the coast of the west coast of uh, British Columbia um, in the 1920s. I think it was 1929 or so. The last one was killed. And when the sea otters were killed, the sea urchin population exploded. Now this has cascading impacts across the ecosystem because what do sea urchins eat? Sea urchins eat kelp. And kelp are basically the underwater equivalent of trees. The same way trees make forests that produce oxygen and create habitat on land, kelp produces oxygen and creates habitat underwater. So in the absence of sea otters, the sea urchin population exploded, created a lot of these urchin barrens replacing kelp forests. Um, and kelp forests are really important habitat for a lot of fish, including especially young salmon, um, but a lot of other small fish that so many animals, birds, seals, whales, all these animals rely on. So this has, you know, the removal of one animal, the sea otter, has cascading impacts across the ecosystem. Fortunately, several decades later, later on in the 1900s, um, sea otters were reintroduced to the west coast of Vancouver Island, brought down from Alaska, and in all the places where sea otters have reestablished themselves, we have once again seen the return of kelp forests um, and the this reducing of the population of the sea urchins. So a prime example of how interconnected this is. And this connects directly to the salmon because those kelp forests create habitat for juvenile salmon in the ocean. So going back to the salmon, we've talked now about you know, some of the animals that eat the salmon out in the ocean and the other animals that and birds that we encounter um, out in the, you know, the ocean environment. But the salmon then, at the end of their lives, make their way into the streams and they head upstream. And along that journey, there are a multitude of creatures waiting to eat them as well. The most common of which is probably gulls. Um, thousands and thousands and thousands of gulls can often be seen in the vicinity of streams where salmon are spawning. These here are glaucous wing gulls, an adult and a juvenile at sunset with some backlight. I love backlight for photography, especially with birds in flight because their feathers are somewhat transparent. You see that light bleed through their wings. Um, but we have tons of gulls and the salmon season is actually a great time to study gull identification here because you often get a lot of species relatively up close. Um, glaucous wing gulls, Thayer's Iceland gulls, Herring gulls, short-billed gulls, ring-billed gulls, California gulls, um, occasionally something rare like a glaucous gull. Um, so we, we Bonaparte's gulls are another big one. They like the salmon eggs and the, and the young salmon. So yeah, a lot of gull species are found around the salmon streams. There's always a lot of herons around streams where salmon spawn as well. Um, they go, they are not really able to swallow most fully grown adult salmon, but the smaller ones, and especially the juvenile salmon, are a perfect size snack for a great blue heron. So we often see um, a lot of uh, a lot of herons. And in many places where the salmon are spawning later in the year, especially this time of year, I also see a lot of swans. Um, I actually should find out, I'm not sure if they're eating the salmon eggs or if they're just feeding on the vegetation in the river, but swans are definitely something that I associate with the salmon spawn as well, because I often see large groups of trumpeter swans congregating in the same areas um, where we have kind of river estuaries where the salmon are spawning. Um, this is three trumpeter swans flying through kind of some thin fog at sunrise and the sun was was being blocked by like a cliff. So it was lighting up half the frame and not the other half. And I photographed the swans as they passed through. So trumpeter swans are the main swan species we see here. Um, they've really been arriving in the past few weeks right now. I've been seeing more and more of them around, but we also get the odd tundra swan, usually recognizable most easily just because they have that little bit of yellow at the base of their beak, um, but they're also smaller and they make a different call. So I actually do often just pick them up by sound um, when they're flying in. And we may be, get one tundra swan for every few hundred trumpeter swans that we have around. Uh, but so both species are around, but the tundra swan here is much rarer than the trumpeter. We also have a lot of corvids, so crows and ravens, like this common raven, that uh, will feast on the salmon as well. Um, the calls of the raven echoing through the forest are very synonymous with the salmon run for me. Um, foggy days and hearing yeah, the sound of the raven above, it's a very, um, it's a very special thing. Um, but ravens aren't the only corvid. Like I said, crows feast on the salmon as well. Um, and I didn't manage to get a good shot of it, but I did actually see Stellar's jays this year. This is just a, another photo of Stellar's jay. I saw Stellar's jays this year uh, scavenging on salmon carcasses, which was very cool to see. Um, super resourceful birds. Um, 
that yeah they I've, I've also for example seen Star Wars Jedi feeding off bugs splat on the front of cars so they they find food in many places and I was not all that surprised for that reason this year to see Stellar's Jays up in the Great Bear Rainforest when I was guiding a tour up there feeding from salmon carcasses which was pretty cool to see. This by the way is the provincial bird of my uh, home province here of British Columbia. And one other bird that um, I definitely think of a lot when I think of the salmon runs are American dippers. American dippers love salmon eggs. And if you look closely in the beak of the dipper here, it does have a salmon egg in its beak. Here's another shot of a dipper with a salmon egg. So dippers, big uh, utilizers of salmon eggs. Um, and, and this one I photographed at like a slow shutter speed to showcase the motion in the river. But the one bird that I've probably spent the most time photographing around the salmon runs has to be the bald eagle. Here's one silhouetted at the top of a tree at sunset. But we actually have, I know Americans, you guys have the eagle as your national bird, but we actually get the biggest gatherings of bald eagles anywhere in the world, right here in southwestern British Columbia, Canada, um, it's around the, uh, the Harrison River. Um, the world record count of eagles in a day is about 10,000. Uh, close to 10,000 eagles have been recorded in a single day. Um, just This is just like two hours from where I live. Um, and it's estimated that there are tens of thousands, maybe 30, 40, 50,000 eagles that spend the late fall and kind of early winter season in this region, which is the largest congregation of bald eagles in the world. Um, it's amazing to watch them. They, I, they, you know, eagles have a reputation of being very majestic birds, but I find they're not quite as majestic maybe as the reputation uh, says they are. They're, I kind of describe them as socially awkward. They get into a, a lot of arguments, both verbal arguments and physical <laughs> arguments, as you can see here. Um, but it's a lot of fun to watch them. And whenever you have large numbers of birds somewhere, in this case, you know, 10,000 eagles all within a few miles, um, it is really nice to keep an eye out for anomalies. And I photographed two individual eagles over the years that have unusual plumage, leucistic eagles. So you can see one here on the right. Um, instead of having a dark brown body, it's kind of got this light brown and white body, which was quite unique. Um, and here's another, a young eagle that is also leucistic. It has some kind of mutation creating much more silvery plumage than normal. Um, normally, young eagles of this age look kind of like this one on the right there. That's probably like a one-year-old eagle. Um, and on the left there is probably a four-year-old eagle. It takes them about five years to get the fully white head and tail. They start dark chocolate brown like that one on the right. Um, by four years old, they kind of look like the one on the left there. They still just have a little bit of dark feathering in their head and tail. Um, I find the two and three-year-olds look quite unique. Often you get these kind of plumages where they've got a lot of white feathering. And it's this plumage, I think, where they can resemble golden eagles a little bit. This is another young bald eagle here. Um, but sometimes people, I think, sometimes mistake the young bald eagles for golden eagles. Um, and golden eagles are very, very rare here. That said, over the years of watching thousands of eagles gathering to feast on the salmon, I have seen golden eagles feeding on salmon twice. Um, this is one golden eagle. You can see the beak shape and coloration is different. Um, the uh, the golden nape is very, very distinct. Um, and the young birds also have very distinct like white patterning um, under the wings, like as you see here. Um, here's another shot of a, of a golden eagle. But the golden eagles are the needles in the haystack. You know, I've seen two feeding on salmon over, you know, well over 10 years of, of really closely watching all the eagles feeding on the salmon. And it's amazing to see such a huge gathering of bald eagles. Um, so bald eagles do spend most of the year um, following around salmon runs, or much of the year anyways. Um, it'll be different for every individual bird, but basically from like late spring up in Alaska all the way through to like January, February down in British Columbia and Washington state, there are salmon runs taking place that bald eagles will feast uh, from. And a lot of eagles will actually follow the salmon runs. So they'll travel from Alaska, Yukon, British Columbia, Washington state. And those are the same eagles kind of going up and down the coast throughout the year feeding on the salmon. Um, and we know this from eagles with trackers on them, um, which has work been done by the Hancock Wildlife Foundation. But what about windows when there's less salmon available or regions that don't have salmon all, all year round? So eagles do have other food sources. And there is one other gathering of bald eagles, which has become my personal favorite to watch and photograph, that takes place every year um, 
kind of in early summer um, around Vancouver Island and the Discovery Islands, where bald eagles fish for hake, which is a type of fish in the cod family. And this is a super unique phenomenon. What happens is there are very specific um, passages between islands that get really, really strong tidal currents. Um, we're talking like 10 to 13 knot currents, um, a, maybe like a few times a month. Um, really, really strong currents. And something with the underwater topography in these passages forces hake, these fish in the cod family, up to the surface very quickly. And it pushes the hake up to the surface unexpectedly. And as a result, the swim bladders, um, which the hake used to control their buoyancy, overinflates. So the hake gets stranded at the surface. You can see one here, just it's stranded at the surface. This is like an, a live fish. It's just but gone stuck at the surface from its swim bladder being um, overinflated. And the eagles have figured this out, that this occurs, and they gather by the hundreds to feast on the hake. Um, it's quite something. And on some days you will have hundreds of hake popping up simultaneously and hundreds of eagles coming in to fish them, fish for them. So as a bird photographer, you know, photographing birds in flight is challenging, but any opportunity where you have repetitive action, things happening over and over and over again, make it a lot easier to get um, shots because you just have many, many opportunities to do so. The hake are usually quite small, but every now and then a big one pops up, as you can see here. Um, and the eagles have learned about this and kind of as they're waiting for the salmon to gather, they feed on hake. The interesting thing is, the hake popping up is a seasonal phenomenon. It happens every year, kind of starts a little bit in late spring, goes into, happens in the summer and continues through much of the summer. But as soon as the salmon show up, the eagles ditch the hake and they go to eat the salmon. So it's quite a uh, an interesting thing. Why they do that, I would guess it's maybe because it's more energy uh, required to um, strike hake out of the water than it is to just eat salmon carcasses. Um, but I don't really know why. It also can be risky for the eagles. You sometimes see them get stuck in the water um, because of they splash in and then they can't they get wet and they can't take off. We've scooped a couple eagles out over the years. Um, but they really like to go to the to the salmon once the salmon return to the streams. So we've looked at some of the birds um, that eat the salmon when they're in the streams. But I also did want to look at one last group of animals, which is the terrestrial wildlife found in this coastal ecosystem. We have an abundance of wonderful terrestrial wildlife species. One of my favorites are, and one of the most elusive, are wolves. So we have coastal wolves, gray wolves, that have basically lived their whole life um, near the coast. They eat a lot of seafood primarily, and you can often find them, well, I say often, but with a lot and a lot of effort, you can sometimes find them on the beaches at low tide looking for any kind of carcass that's washed up, anything that they can find in the intertidal zone. But Come salmon season, the wolves actually will move to the streams and hunt for salmon. They are inc incredibly elusive. It's a very hard thing to witness, partially because I think they just are elusive animals that don't want to be seen. Here's a wolf kind of hiding amongst the debris. Um, if you look very closely, just kind of up and left from center, you can see the wolf staring through the uh, washed up log. Um, but wolves eat salmon. This year was actually the first year I managed to see this with my own eyes, was wolves fishing for salmon. Um, it unfortunately was very, very far away, so I didn't really get any good shots of it. But um, it was nonetheless an amazing thing to witness. So you do often see wolves in the vicinity of salmon streams. And I say often as in every, every now and then, like it, it happens and you're more likely to see a wolf around a salmon stream than somewhere random. But wolves are very, very elusive. Um, I, there are a lot of animals that you can sneak up on. A wolf isn't really one of them. Wolves have incredible senses, amazing eyesight, amazing smell, amazing hearing. So encounters with wolves tend to happen on their own terms only. So the, on the rare occasion where I, I get you know a glimpse into the life of a wolf, it is a very, very special experience. The main salmon eating predator that is known though, are the bears. Um, and we have a healthy uh, number of grizzly bears in certain parts of the coast, especially like up in the Great Bear Rainforest. Um, some populations are doing better than others, but um, it is an animal that is, uh, that is I'm, I feel very lucky to get to be a guide who gets to go show people these animals. Um, and every year the grizzly bears come and they fish for salmon. I call this photo bear hug. 
Um, the bear is definitely not giving the salmon a hug, but it sure looks like it. It kind of scooped it out from the water and wrestled it up on the riverbank. This is a big chum salmon here. And for the bears, salmon is more than just a tasty food source here. They are a fundamental, irreplaceable part of their diet for a lot of populations of bears on the coast. So bears mate in the spring um, and the egg gets fertilized, but the blastocyst, that slightly developed fertilized egg, doesn't actually implant in the uterus and begin to develop until the fall. And it will only do so if the female bear has obtained sufficient nutrients. And there's not a, an equal number of salmon every year, especially in, in the modern era, the era of, you know, dammed rivers and heavy commercial fishing, fishing and all this stuff. Um, there's not necessarily guaranteed always to be tons of salmon um, in, in the rivers. So the number of salmon that the bears eat correlates with how many cubs we see the next year. In years with lots of salmon, you're a lot more likely to see female bears with like three cubs. In years that there's not a lot of salmon, you might see grizzly bears with no cubs or just like one cub. So the amount of salmon that they eat directly correlates to how many young they have because those fertilized eggs will not develop if she has not obtained sufficient nutrients. And the number of eggs that will develop correlates to how how well fed she's been. So she so they will their own bodies will abort the eggs that they won't be able to sustain because they have to last the whole winter in their hibernation without eating and they still have to be providing milk for their young. And one of the rewards of, of getting to be a guide that takes people to these amazing places is that you get to know the bears because you see the same individuals year after year. This year is a cub photograph two years ago. This past summer, I got to see this cub again um, with still with its mom and they were all just a year older. So it's really special to get to see these animals year after year and just to know that they're still doing okay. So we get grizzly bears, we also get black bears, and like the wolves, they actually spend a lot of the year in the intertidal zone. They're eating crabs and mussels, but come salmon season, they a lot of them move to the streams where they fish for salmon. Now we have a very, very unique um, type of black bear in British Columbia found nowhere else in the world, known as the spirit bear. The spirit bear is a very rare animal. There's maybe only a few hundred of them in existence. Um, and it's basically a black bear with a rare uh, mutation, a recessive mutation that turns their fur completely white. And as it turns out, it seems that these spirit bears have a slightly higher success fishing for salmon, uh, especially in daylight, because they actually camouflage from the perspective of a salmon quite well with a bright sky. Um, so despite it being a recessive mutation that uh, is rare, you actually do get 10 to 20 percent of the black bears in the Great Bear Rainforest having white fur. Um, and they are beautiful, mythical creatures, rare, but um, if you go to the Great Bear Rainforest, the only place where you can see these animals, uh, the Great Bear and the surroundings area, if you go during salmon season, that is the best bet you will have to, uh, to see one of these animals. Now, a lot of these salmon eating animals, like the bears, um, have of course, paws and mouths, which they use to pick up salmon, and often they'll go carry those salmon off into the forest when they eat them. And eagles often do the same thing. Eagles have talons, and they will pick up fish or chunks of fish with their talons, and often too, they'll carry pieces of fish into the forest where they eat them, and they're messy eaters. They drop bits of salmon down into the forest floor. The bears, when food are plentiful, are picky eaters. They will actually sometimes only go for specific parts of the salmon, so the bears will eat their favorite are the roe, the eggs from the female salmon. So they leave behind a lot of the salmon in the forest. And, and of course, all these animals, regardless of where they're eating the salmon, are pooping in the forest. And in doing so, salmon fertilize the soil in the forest. It's not that unusual usual to be walking in a forest not too far from a river during the fall here and just see a head of a salmon staring at you through the leaves, decomposing. And those salmon nutrients that are brought into the forest by birds like eagles, animals like bears, decompose, fertilize the soil, and contribute to the growth of the beautiful rainforest, these massive trees that this part of the world is really known for. So if you look at the rings of a tree, like when a tree is cut or if it falls, if you look at the rings of a tree, you can directly tell which years had the most salmon because years with more salmon correspond to thicker tree rings. So the forests around the salmon streams grow bigger and faster um, than those that aren't near salmon streams. 
So there is this incredible connection between all these animals in the ecosystem from the salmon that goes all the way up to the forest itself and therefore the habitat that all the birds and wildlife live in and the very air that we're breathing all can be connected back to these salmon. And this summer, I really wanted to try to capture a photo that told the story of this ecosystem in some way, that highlighted the bear and the salmon and the forest all in one shot. And I spent about a week on this photo, figuring out where I could find a spot where I could maybe have my camera half in the water, half above water. It had to be somewhere there were constantly salmon going by and occasionally bear going by. And after a lot of effort, this was the shot that I got. Um, a pink salmon in the river below, a bear walking by in the background, and the forest behind. Um, like I said, one of a very challenging photo to get, one of the most ambitious photos I've ever attempted. Um, the key was that it needed to be a spot, I found like a bottleneck in a river where there was just always salmon congregating, because bears walk by relatively infrequently in any given spot. So if I just needed it to be a place that when a bear walked by, there was very high chances there would be a salmon in the frame at the same time. And after finding the spot, I spent three full days with the camera in the water. I actually set up the camera in the water and then I set it to just trigger remotely. And I went up and out of sight so that I wasn't, you know, impacting the bears and, and, and scaring them off. So I just kind of left the camera in the river and, and you know, stood far away. Um, and three days later, after that camera was in the water for three days, this is the one photo that I got. Um, but so far, one of my better attempts to capture the story of this ecosystem in one photo. So yeah, this is such a spectacular part of the world. I, I feel so fortunate to be based here. And I also feel fortunate, as I've mentioned a few times, to be a guide. I get to showcase this part of the world to people from all around the, all around the world. Um, so I just wanted to share briefly here, if you are interested in experiencing these ecosystems for yourself, um, the Great Bear Rainforest uh, is an amazing place to witness the salmon run. Um, you'll get to see the salmon, you'll get to see an amazing variety of seabirds, you'll get to see bears, you have a chance of seeing a rare creature like a wolf. I'll be guiding again in the Great Bear Rainforest from August 28th to September 4th. And if you're a photographer and you'd like to photo, so the Great Bear Rainforest trip is not a photography specific trip, although amazing photo opportunities on that trip as well. Um, but the my bald eagle and coastal wildlife photography workshops that I do every year out of Campbell River in British Columbia is a photography focused workshop. Um, and the dates are filling up, but you can see those on screen here. Um, I also would like to announce that I am developing an Ecuador bird photography tour that's gonna be bookings opening very soon. That'll be in November, 2024. And I also run photography trips in Alberta. These are ethical, no baiting, no calling photography trips uh, focused on owls and raptors. Um, 2024 is sold out, but bookings will be opening for 2025 very soon. Um, but with that, I would just like to say thank you. I, I really hope you enjoy the photos and, and hearing about my corner of the world. Like I said, I feel so lucky to live in, in such an amazing place for bird and wildlife photography. Um, and yeah, so I really appreciate you inviting me to come present here. And I'm just going to throw my email in the chat here. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has, but I'm also just going to put my email in the chat here in case anyone has any questions about anything that later in the future. <laughs> all I can say is, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're all we're used to seeing bird pictures, graphs, charts. This was amazing. I. And I, 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 I'm sure nobody has signed off. So that that <laughs> was, uh, what, what, what joy, you know, just to see all this. Um, I'll just kick off a few questions. Um, I, I kept looking at the bears and thinking, are they not? Do do they not see you? Are you afraid of them? Do they not attack humans? Yes, great question. Very, very good question. So. Most Common of the question, photos, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's a really, it's honestly an important question. I should have, I should have actually talked about that a little bit. So um, we have a lot of bears on the coast here. In fact, we have some of the densest bear populations in the whole world. Um, so having a understanding of bear behavior and, and safety and a respect towards them is really, really important. All the bear photos, with the exception of this one on the screen right now that you saw in today's presentation, were taken with a big telephoto lens, so I was not very close to them. And this picture was taken with a wide-angle lens, but I wasn't I wasn't holding the camera. I was far away. Right. So 
for all these bear photos, I'm quite far away. That said, it's really important to be respectful to the bears. Let them dictate the the encounter to some extent in that we're not wanting to approach close to them. Um, if they come close to us, okay, but also there are boundaries. And the, the neat thing is that the bears know these boundaries. Um, a lot of the places where people see bears, the bears have some kind of they're they're used to humans being around in some sense there's not a lot of visitors to places like the great bear rainforest it is quite a restricted in in the sense that there's not hundreds of people visiting there it's like you know a small group a day sort of thing um maybe like 10 12 people but um still the bears in these areas where people are viewing them learn the rules in that they they are used to people being where people are they're not used to people running up to them so they would certainly, I'm sure, not act kindly if that happened. But they are used to people floating by in a zodiac. For a lot of these bear shots, I'm in a little floating zodiac on the water, for example. Um, bears do have a reputation of being dangerous animals, and they are certainly capable of, of they're very strong and powerful animals. Um, however, when we treat them with respect, when we give them space, we respect their boundaries, we don't um, create scenarios where there's attractants like food left out. It is really, really possible to coexist with them. I've probably seen something in the ballpark of a thousand different individual black bears and 150 different individual grizzly bears, and I've yet to have even one single negative encounter. Um, so I think when they're treated with respect, um, it is totally possible to coexist and to watch them also without having an impact because we don't want to be like negatively influencing their ability to, to find food. And guides for bears in British Columbia also are required to be certified and have a course training, which which oh, I do have as well. That makes sense. Um, I was uh, I was just in Ecuador for four days in August in the highlands, four days, 150 life birds. <laughs> of which 20, 20 were hummingbird species and seven were ant pitta species. Wow. Um, so uh, I'm, I, I, if anybody on here is a photographer and wants to go to a great place uh, mm -hmm. for photography, I mean, just amazing birds. Um, yeah. I, I also had a question about the red knots. What <laughs> time of year was that? Because they were in breeding plumage. Yeah, so that would have been, I think, the first week of May. Um, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, first week of May. So we get them, they're an uncommon but annual migrant. So we get small numbers of them in the spring and small numbers of them in the fall. Actually, occasionally we get the odd one overwintering. Um, but the only um, the only time to see them in their colors is in the spring. And this is the only time I've ever encountered such a large flock of red knots. This is all of them here. It's not even that many. But this is the only time I've encountered such a, a group of like just red knots um, on the coast of British Columbia. Normally when I see red knots, it's like one mixed in with like 400 black-bellied plovers or two mixed in with a thousand black-bellied plovers. Um, so I this didn't was a know cool, they were on the cool West Coast at all. I, I associated them with New England, right? Yeah, so. I, there's a, I think there's a, a smaller breeding population up in, I think, Alaska that would probably, I assume those would be the ones, I, I might be wrong, but I, I think those would be the ones that we would see on the West Coast here. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have any questions that there was one chat message that about our January speaker, there's a, um, you can look at um, the falconer film.com and see something about our January speaker, but did anyone else have any specific questions about Liran's amazing? I mean, I it's not just the, it's not just the photography. I mean, again, we're used to bird photographers and stuff, <laughs> but that you're, um, understanding of the whole ecosystem and the relation of everything relationships is fantastic and I think we Thank all <laughs> learned learned an awful lot um Sunny why don't you unmute everybody so anybody can say anything if they want and um meanwhile we so appreciate your joining us today it was <laughs> amazing and we're looking forward to your next <laughs> wonderful <laughs> project whatever it may be because these, thank these you. are wonderful thank, thank you me. thank you <laughs> the, the thank just you amazing. Ron thank yeah, you just a stunning photography and your knowledge it's just amazing thank you thank you I appreciate it
<laughs> have you published the uh your your whole salmon story anywhere? This um, not yet, no. 